Hello, and welcome to the 2022 December Dialogues from the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion here at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This year's program is Celebrating All That We Are, a conversation on sex, gender, and identity. My name is Katie Hinman, and I am the director of the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. And I'm delighted to welcome those of you who are joining us here in person, as well as the many folks who are joining us virtually through the magic of Zoom. A few notes before we get started. We have an ASL interpreter here in the auditorium for those joining us live. And for those joining us online, live captioning is available. Please select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. For those joining virtually, you can find a copy of this evening's program at the link provided in the chat. Those of you here in person should have received one as you came in. If you did not, there are some at the back entrance. In order to allow for full participation in the discussion portion of the program, we are going to be using menti.com to facilitate our Q&A for both those here in the auditorium and those joining on Zoom. So we will not have live questions here. We will invite everyone here as well as on Zoom to use Menti to submit your questions. Um, there's a QR code and link in your program that you can follow. And those joining us on Zoom, that should be in the chat. You can visit menti.com and put in the code 52949292. And this will be up on the screen during the program as well. You can submit questions throughout the program. You can also upvote other people's questions if, if folks are asking questions that you also have. You have the ability to upvote their questions. I also want to remind everyone of the AAAS Code of Conduct to which you agreed when registering, and you can find linked in your program. We want to create an inclusive and shared space here. This is a place to both share and to learn. And both can be, at times, uncomfortable and challenging. Uh, questions will be submitted anonymously, so this is a safe space to ask questions that you may have been afraid to ask or found uncomfortable. However, bigotry, hate speech, insults and cruelty and harassment are unacceptable. It's absolutely unacceptable to question anyone's humanity or right to exist, and if this becomes an issue, we will ask participants to leave. Each of us speaks from our own knowledge and experience, and we do not expect individuals to represent entire disciplines or entire demographics. And we're also each responsible for our own emotions and not placing the burden of managing them on others. This is a conversation that we hope will spur further conversations and reflection. So we encourage a mindset of curiosity rather than judgment in the face of disagreement. It's more constructive to build on shared values rather than shared beliefs. And so please keep these values in mind as we enter this space. As we gather here and around the country, I do want to gratefully acknowledge all of the diverse and vibrant indigenous peoples on whose ancestral homelands we stand. Here in Washington, DC, we are on the ancestral homeland of the indigenous Piscataway and Nacotchtank Anacostan peoples. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and future, and to all those who have stewarded the, the land and water for generations. For those in North America, I encourage you to visit native-land.ca as a starting point to see what indigenous communities call your region home and learn more about them. And I also suggest that you check out Dozer's profile series on science engagement with faith communities, which includes profiles of several indigenous scholars, including Dr. Annette Lee, Dr. Rosita Kahani Worrell, and Kellen LeCourconant. Of particular relevance to tonight's conversation, LeCourt Conan, a AAAS if-then ambassador, explicitly talks about their non-binary identity as being relevant to their public engagement work. So I invite you to check those resources out. Unfortunately, our CEO, Dr. Sudip Parikh, is traveling this week and unable to be here in person, but he asked me to welcome you here on his behalf and on behalf of AAAS. The American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, is the world's largest general scientific society. AAAS is the publisher of the science family of journals, and in addition, has many amazing programs that help us fulfill our mission to advance science and serve society. One of these programs is the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, or DOZER, affectionately, which facilitates communication and engagement between scientific and religious communities, recognizing that these often overlap. 
I encourage you to check out our resource website at sciencereligiondialogue.org where you can find videos, articles, and other resources. And I also want to uh, invite you to join us in March of 2023 where you can find Dozer at the AAAS annual meeting here in Washington, DC, and also online. I hope you'll plan to join us for any or all of our sessions. We are hosting a symposium entitled Is Space for Everyone? Ethics from Earth to Space and Back, a workshop on science engagement with people of faith and a networking reception. And you can visit meetings.aaas.org for more information and to register for that event. And please stay connected with us through our websites and newsletter. AAAS is a nonprofit organization, and programs like Dozer are funded through grants and through private donations. So if you'd like to make a donation to support the work of Dozer, you can do so at AAAS.org slash support Dozer. So once again, I welcome you to our program tonight, Celebrating All That We Are, a conversation on sex, gender, and identity. Conversations about sex, gender, and identity have always fascinated us, encouraged us, and unsettled us. Throughout history, these issues have drawn people together and divided them. We engage these conversations drawing not only on science, but also on our personal experience, our religious beliefs, and faith traditions. Dozer felt it was important to provide an opportunity for conversation and reflection on this topic, recognizing that these issues are very personal. But if we want to be true to AAAS's mission of advancing science and serving society, we have to be willing to engage in difficult conversations. In doing so, we are so honored to have tonight's speakers here to share with us and to engage in dialogue with us. I will introduce them briefly as they all make their way to the stage and then give them a chance to share a little more about themselves and their work. So y'all can come on up to the stage as I'm introducing you. Uh, Dr. Ann Fausto Sterling is Brown University Professor Emerita and Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's a leading expert on the development of sexual identity as well as the biology of gender. Dr. Meredith Righteous is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and a rabbinical student at Hebrew College. Righteous investigates how tenacious received ideas about sex and gender shape reconstructions of human origins and understandings of contemporary human bodies. And August LaPerch is interim co-executive director and program director for the Q Christian Fellowship, where they work to cultivate radical belonging for LGBTQIA plus Christians and allies. LaPerch has a bachelor's degree in social work and a master of arts in theological studies. And Dr. Robert O'Malley will serve as our moderator for our discussion. He's project director here at Dozer and an anthropologist with a PhD in integrative and evolutionary biology. Each of our speakers will share some brief remarks individually and then we'll move into some moderated discussion, after which we will have opportunity for questions from the audience. So as a reminder, throughout the program, you may submit questions through Menti as well as upvote other questions for the Q&A portion. It is now my pleasure to invite to the podium Dr. Ann Fausto Sterling. Thank you. You didn't tell me I was going to be first, but <laughs> um, so I guess we were asked to say a little bit about ourselves and our background and a little bit about sort of how we approach some of the issues with science and human values. Um, my original training is as a developmental biologist, um, developmental geneticist, um, and I did that work for a number of years, always intrigued by the complexity of the embryo and the sort of astounding transformations it went through, uh, it goes through. Uh, but I became, not very surprisingly, because I was a child of the 60s, um, interested in, involved in feminism and um, began to understand, began to get asked by my political colleagues uh, what, you know, what biology had to do with gender and sex. And I kind of didn't know at first, so I wrote this book. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I learned by writing the book. The book was called Myths of Gender, um, Biological Theories About Women and Men. Um, and 
I wrote that in the, in the mid 80s. And one of the things that I learned by writing this book was, um, was something I, I sort of already knew from being a biologist, which is that sex is complicated. And historically, uh, in the 50s and early 60s, particularly some psychologists um, and medical people, John Money among them, um, Robert Stoller, a psychiatrist uh, among them, um, couldn't deal with the complexity of sex, felt it couldn't, as a word, couldn't cover everything, couldn't do all the work it was expected to do, everything from who you fell in love with to whether you, what chromosomes you had. Um, and so they invented a second term, um, and that term was gender. Uh, and gender, um, but, uh, and gender did a lot of work, political work for feminists, um, uh, it took the pressure off the biologists to explain human behavior because most basic biologists really don't like to have to do that. Um, and, uh, and it did a lot of work, but it's come under increasing pressure itself in the last couple of decades um, because it has it was constructed still as a as a binary set of ideas, um, and so uh, more recently, gender studies scholars um, have been trying to work, and I approach this from the point of view of my scholarship primarily, uh, have tried to invent. Um, a different way of looking at the world or looking at, at human organisms and, and, it, and need, again, different words to do it. And the words that um, are getting played with in the sort of biofeminist world are, um, are, are even more horrific. They're, they are um, because they have slashes in them. Um, so the word that I'm using to, to describe um, to describe what we're working with is gender slash sex slash uality, so it's gender sexuality. And I view these words, these all as one thing because they are intermingled and interacting in the organism and in the world. Um, so uh, I've been writing about about sex and gender since the mid 80s, uh, Myths of Gender, then I wrote a book called Sexing the Body um, and a small textbook called Sex, Gender, Biology in a Social World. Um, and I'm currently working on a book on the development of gender sexuality identity and especially focusing on what happens before the age of three. So I'm really interested in infants and toddlers and how, um, how our cultural world becomes embodied. Um, how, how they start to embody the cultural world that they're raised in. Uh, and I think this work matters because we need a way of looking um, at human variability with regard to gender sex, that, and we need a way that is embracing, mutually respectful, and pleasurable. Um, and so finally, I, I guess I know this is a forum on religion, and so I should just put it out there that I'm an atheist. Um, but I, I certainly was raised with a set, a very strong set of human values, um, um, because I was raised as a young socialist with the following motto, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. And in every aspect of federal and state and local policy today, I still believe that very strongly. Um, and that the values then that come with that are fairness, equal opportunity, empathy and caring, and safety and community. So that's what I have to say. Hi. I am Meredith Righteous and Perhaps like many people in this room who are drawn to events like this, I've had the opportunity and the impetus to think about sex, gender, and the body through a couple of disciplinary lenses. And right now I wear two different hats. One is whatever hat you would picture on a scholar, perhaps a mortar board. Um, my training is in human evolutionary biology, biocultural anthropology, and feminist science studies. And the other hat is a yarmulke. I am also in rabbinical school. So I'm gonna be thinking and talking with you through those lenses this evening. And there was a kind of circuitous journey to get to these places. Uh, after the phase of childhood during which I thought I would live on a horse farm, which I think is what every Midwestern child in the 90s went through, 
Uh, I learned what a PhD was, and I wanted one. I thought it was as much school as you could go to. It turned out I was wrong. And I thought at the end you would have all the knowledge there was to have, which you actually graduate knowing how much you don't know. But uh, once I got to college, I got a little bit more particular about not only the amount of truth, but the kind. And I had what I think of as my positivist moment, where I thought, well, you know, literature's great, but science is where the truth lies. And the sort of kind of linguistically brutal way I put this at the time was to say, the body doesn't lie. People lie, even when we don't intend to. But the body does not. And it took years for me to really learn that the questions we ask about the body the data we collect and the way we interpret it are all reflections of things we already believe. Those shape what we wonder and how we ask our questions. So that revelation was, was pretty important to the way I ended up becoming a scientist. Now, I had been reading a lot of scholars who were thinking about sex, gender, and the body from an evolutionary perspective. And this is very connected to some things that Anne just said, because when, when I stumbled into the world of evolutionary biology, it was heavily inflected by a school of thought called sociobiology, which was the idea that evolution shapes not only our bodies, but also our behavior. So this was, in, in the terms that Anne was using perhaps, an attempt to sort of absorb gender under the umbrella of sex. People looked at the world around them and said, when we see differences, those differences are the result of the action of evolution. So not only are they natural, but they are in a sense potentially inevitable. They're things that no amount of well-intentioned pushes for equality can change. And so you might say that there's a way in which my career since then has been an attempt to push back against the naturalistic fallacy. So here is where I have landed as a bit of a mission statement. Uh, anytime sex or gender comes up, the questions that come to the fore of my mind, so maybe more mission questions than statement, include uh, what work is the concept doing in this context? What work do we want or need it to do? Are we using sex, gender, sexuality to explain something about the world, like a pattern of inequality that we see? And is it the best approach to explain that pattern? What structures of power does that explanation privilege? And what or whom does it make invisible? So something that comes from the, the Jewish world that I'm now moving in that I found really powerful is the idea that we can make our traditions, be they intellectual or spiritual, a shift from the question, can I be or do a particular thing in this space? Is this allowed? Is this natural? To how do I use the language of my tradition or my discipline to talk about this, to center this? to make this part of what is uh, joyful and normative in this space. And I'm working on a collection of essays called Heteroskeptical, which uh, is attempting to poke, sometimes gently, sometimes less gently, at how our ideas about gender and sex and sexuality create cultures, relationships, and imaginations and constraints on those imaginations, and to ask what else might be possible. Hello, uh, my name is August LaPerch and my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. I am a queer, non-binary trans person and I live in Fort Worth, Texas. Pause for the sigh of dismay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I work with Q Christian Fellowship, as was mentioned, we are uh, the largest national nonprofit that supports LGBTQ plus Christians, as well as their parents, families, and allies. We are a remote organization, so we have a nonprofit incorporation in Ohio, not particularly interesting, um, but we're about 20 years old, and our, our staff works all over the country. We reach folks mostly in North America, but we also have an international reach through virtual programming that we offer. 
We do in-person events and retreats and experiences. All of the work that we do is focused on equity and inclusion and affirmation for LGBTQ plus folks um, who are identifying with Christianity in some degree. So I like to say that because we're such a big tent organization and we don't have a statement of beliefs, but rather we have a set of values that center us. Uh, when we talk about Christianity, I'm talking about anyone from folks who identify with evangelicalism and are also affirming or are questioning around affirming their own identities as LGBTQ plus people, so more conservative theologically possibly, all the way to Christian adjacent post-Christian folks. Um, there's room for everyone um, and we do focus on Christianity um, through our theological resources and through the theologically trained members on staff, but we are very much focused primarily on the affirmation and belonging, cultivating radical belonging for all of God's children. Um, so that is some of the work that I get to do uh, as interim co-executive director and program director with QCF. Personally, um, I was raised in South Central Florida and then went to a conservative Christian university in Virginia. Don't really need to say the name. Many of you probably know what I'm talking about um, since we're in the area. But uh, I went there because I was passionate about my faith and wanted to be around other young people who were passionate about their faith. I also felt a sense of call to ministry, which is how I ended up in a Christian context for my undergrad. And when I was there, I experienced a lot of negativity around uh, pushing gender binaries as someone who um, is, I now know that I'm not cisgender and know my gender identity a lot more expansively, but in my, when I was 17, 18, 19, 19 years old, just knew I wasn't a man fundamentally. Um, and not being a man in those conservative faith spaces already disadvantages you very much. Um, especially if you're passionate about Christian ministry. So long story short, uh, I was a victim or a survivor, however you may want to frame it, um, both and, of conversion therapy programming at Liberty University. Um, oops, I said it. Um, <laughs> that was not a shout out. That was to drag them. And um, while I was there, I endured violence and harassment around my sexual orientation and gender identity, um, but have been able to, now I work in such a glorious realm of affirmation and belonging Belonging and get to be a, a theological faith leader, thought leader, subject matter expert in LGBTQ plus conversations, especially around the intersection of faith. Um, and my experience in conversion therapy and the fact that I know that it is still happening today, not just at one particular place, but across the country and across the world, is a big part of why I believe so strongly in the importance of these kinds of intersectional conversations, because for many years of my life, folks with more progressive and inclusive ideology were so out of touch to me, who was raised in a much more conservative environment, but had questions and curiosities um, and wanted to interrogate some of the beliefs that I was handed. And so I think it's really important, this kind of work that we're doing here together, having this conversation and making it accessible to folks. Um, so I'm grateful to be here, grateful to be part of it. Thank you all for being here as well. Not to steal your thunder, Rob. <laughs> um, but I just want to express my gratitude for this opportunity and happy to chat more extensively if you all want to connect afterwards as well. Thank you. Again, thank you all for being here. So I'm Rob O'Malley, I'm a project, my pronouns are uh, he and him. Um, I am a project director at uh, the Dialogue on Science, Ethics and Religion. Uh, my background is uh, evolutionary biology, but uh, I studied primate behavior um, for a long time. Um, that was my field of interest, um, feeding ecology, nutrition, things like that. And I wanted to say at the outset, um, I'm so tremendously grateful for all of you joining us here today. Um, because it's really encouraged me to think much more deeply about some elements of biology and how um, some topics like evolution kind of intersect with humanity in ways that I really honestly had not delved into 
uh, to a deep degree to before. So I'm really grateful for that conversation that we're having here, for the opportunity to kind of learn about um, your scholarship and your programs, um, and really viewing this as uh, the start of some learning for me personally, um, and not the end. Um, so what I thought we'd start with um, before we, we will have, of course, um, a chance to hear from the audience. Um, the QR code should be online and um, uh, above me, uh, behind us here. Um, so we will uh, get to those in a, in a little bit. Um, but I thought first we might um, delve uh, into some uh, deeper questions that, that really kind of resonate with what you, what you all shared already. Um, something Anne said at the beginning um, that it would be love to, I'd love to delve into a little bit more deeply is, you know, sex is complicated and also gender is complicated and as, as, as Anne said, often intermingled. Um, could you, could, could each of you maybe share a bit about um, why these terms do defy easy categorization um, from your perspective? Um, and maybe Anne, you could start first if you're willing. So why why these categories define? Oh, yeah, why 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 terms like sex and gender um, are complicated, as you said? Um, well, they're complicated because they try to describe a um, uh, they try to describe a highly variable world of both biology and human behavior and culture uh, with a single term and. The ter in any in any of the cases, any one of these words does way too much work, um, and it decontextualizes any conversation. So that the I mean I, I I get into these little side arguments on Twitter, in which I'll I'll you know publish some short op-ed kind of piece in which I go over um, say the the levels of sex as John Money saw it. So, and he'd start with chromosomes and fetal hormones and, um, and hormones at birth and um, input from culture at birth and he'd build up through adolescence in a whole series. And people would just tweet back to me, yeah, but they're eggs and sperm, it's simple, there's just two. And so it's that, um, and yet, and to have that conversation and you say, well, yeah, there are eggs and sperm, but there are people we call men who don't have sperm and there are people we call women who don't have eggs. And um, are they, because they don't have those, what are they? And there are people we, we classify as women who have a Y chromosome and, and so on and so forth. In other words, the actual biological world and the actual social world is way more complex than any one word can, um, can cover. Uh, and so when we use a term like sex or a term like gender, uh, it tends to fix the conversation in a way that usually isn't very helpful uh, because each person then has their own idea of, of what it's fixed as. Some, so, so you say sex and some people say, oh, chromosomes. And you say sex and other people say, oh, testosterone. Um, and, and so forth. And no one of these things really covers, comes near to covering the variety of humans that there are in the world to say nothing of the variety of cultures of which you can talk more about. Um, so they don't, they're not, they're, they're not useful words in, in, a, they, they tend, they try to do too much work. They can't do all the work that people expect of them. May I say something? Yeah, that? yeah. yeah. And, and building on what you're saying, I think it can be important to ask, what is the specific work we're asking that word to do in in a given context? Because um, when, when we encounter people in the world and if we're making an assumption about about their gender, as, as we often do, we don't generally ask them to drop their trousers so that we can check if their genitalia match what we what we think is going on. Uh, there, there's like a social performance of gender that is that is one thing that is happening. And then if you're seeking medical care and the facts of your body shift what care is gonna be useful to you, that's a different context. I, I have a friend who's a physician who, when she sees patients uh, who are partnered, asks them what they and their partner or partners like to do for fun, just as a way of completely opening up the field to, all right, you tell me what are the behaviors involved, what are the body parts involved, I'm not gonna assume any of these things, because the context here is we wanna make sure that you are getting the health care you need for your particular sexual context. Um, so I think that that's another, that's just another elaboration on how we ask a word to do work that it can't actually do. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that um, to your point, language can be so limited. And I really liked the word you used there of decontextualizing. I think from a faith perspective, especially in Christianity in America, we see so often folks will say, well, the Bible says there was man and woman. It's Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. And one man, one woman, that's how all people were created. And they pull so much um, out of context, both cultural context, literary context, historical context. And folks will argue against the existence of trans and gender expansive people and ex against the existence of sexual orientation, diversity, um, or against the validity of those identities in particular, um, trying to use a historic text <laughs> that is being decontextualized um, and being pulled and uh, trying to be pushed, uh, pushing a certain agenda or certain belief system. Um, and so I do think that generally speaking, it's, it's just that language can be so politicized and language can evolve so much over time um, that what someone means by the word sex 50 years ago, based on what we have documented about, about what they thought the word sex meant versus what it meant and lived you know, day-to-day -day life, and um, some of it is just the lack of scholarship, the lack of depth of scholarship around these topics, and a lot of that, namely being uh, the missing piece of LGBTQ plus scholars and ancestors in scholarship. So I would just, that's what I would add, yeah. Thank you, no, that's, I think that's, that is very helpful um, reflections. Um, Something that uh, you may have noticed when, when you, if you came into the uh, building today is that we have advancing science serving society um, under the AAAS logo when you come in. And um, that is, I think, part of how AAAS kind of frames how we think about science, that science is this way of, um, of gathering, disseminating knowledge that's very powerful. Um, but also it, in many cases, really should be in, in service to something, right? That this is something that we people are doing um, and, and so for my next question, I wanted to kind of explore perhaps recognizing that these terms uh, have real limitations. Um, there is, you know, this kind of, I think a real paradigm shift in terms of um, thinking about them with more nuance, trying to contextualize sex and gender in all the different forms and contexts that these can take. What do we gain or what could we gain by, by kind of reframing whether it's science scholarship or you know theological perspectives in this more expansive nuanced frameworks these more advanced uh, nuanced frameworks and i invite any of you to share well i i, I kind of want to second something that that meredith said in this regard which is that is that um for me the specific facts of science have got to be very localized. And so, um, you know, how a sea urchin does sex is different from how, um, I don't know, how a bear does sex. I mean, they're, they're, and, um, and, there's, and, and, and how they're different depends on their environmental context, their, how they're affected by the environment, all of those sorts of things. But when we start to study humans, it's not, it's, it's, insufficient and probably just really wrong to, to take what we know from sea urchins and say, well, so this is how humans are. And so I want to get back to Meredith's point of view, po point, which is that what we need to be doing if we're trying to understand human gender sexuality, um, as a developmental biologist, I want to know, of course, how it develops. Um, but if we want to study it in adults, say in the context of healthcare, we cannot start with our definitions, which we derive from sea urchins and fruit flies and stuff. We have to do qualitative research, starting with the people who um, who are requiring better healthcare or better um, better ways of maneuvering in in a particular society. So, um, so we have science for me. Then is much more about good methods how you get the right s sample size, how you, um, how you ask people questions, but it isn't about coming in with our definition of sex and saying, you person on the internet, will you check this box I've called sex? 
but rather you person on the internet, how would you describe yourself? Um, so it's, it's about devising, for me, not doing away with science, but devising methods that actually contextually address the questions that we want answers to. I'd love to respond relating to something, August, that you were saying about the historical context of texts and, and how we can be expansive there. Um, two thoughts. One is that yesterday in rabbinical school, uh, we, were, we were reading the story of um, Abraham having sent his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac from among his people and finding Rebecca at the well. And the word that is used to describe her before we get her name is the Hebrew for young man. It is Na'ar. And it's interesting because if you open a Hebrew text, there will be uh, the word for young woman and then in parentheses, the word for young man, being, it says, no, no, but say young woman. This is what's written here, but that's not what we say. So there's this really interesting moment in the text where the people who have tried to sort of norm what's going on there have actually changed the language that we've inherited. And that's something I never would have known if I had not begun to study biblical Hebrew and to be able to engage that text in its original. Similarly, in the archaeology world that some of my colleagues inhabit, there's been a revisiting of burials in which weaponry has been found. This has been happening in Viking burials and also in South America. Maybe you, you have more to say about this. Anytime weapons are found in a grave, it was assumed that that grave was a male burial. DNA tests of the bones in those graves and some other factors around them have suggested that actually many of them are burials of folks who we would today biologically understand as female. We don't know how they gendered themselves or how their communities gendered them at that time, but it's changing the narrative about who might have filled what role in that society. So I think to August's point, um, trying to think more deeply about history and context can also help us with, with what Rob was asking about the rich work of making more complex uh, gender and sex. Yeah, I mean, um, there are, I think, also archaeological burials where you might have um, several skeletons that have been contextualized as, as men um, who are literally buried together in an embrace, and then the you know the, interpre the, the historical interpretation might be something like they were probably really good friends, you know, <laughs> and it's like best you know, friends and roommates. Best, yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, and, and you know, lots of historical examples of like you know digging a little deeper into some of these historical accounts, you know, suggests that um, you know maybe some things are 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 being uh, obscured that are very clearly true with a more uh, nuanced perspective on human relationships. Um, what about what about things like like you know in a very practical sense, health, and um, how you know taking this back to sort of human human needs, immediate human needs, and human flourishing. What do we what do we gain in that context by maybe a more expansive attitude about sex and gender in, in healthcare in mental health? Well, I'll speak to like gender affirming care, um, which is kind of the umbrella term for anything from hormone replacement therapy to gender affirming surgeries. Uh, gender affirming care also under that umbrella is uh, like what you mentioned, forms that have more than two binary options for a sex identifier. Um, or if they ask about your gender, having either many things listed, fill in the blank, a uh, place for pronouns so that folks can address you properly and even preferred name. All of those things are considered gender affirming care. Um, so folks sometimes will limit gender affirming care because the media talks so much about hormones and surgery when it comes to trans and gender expansive people. But it's really this huge breadth of affirming the humanity and identities of trans and gender expansive and LGBTQ plus folks. Um, and so we know from statistics, from research that like at a basic level, using someone's pronouns is a form of suicide prevention. It has shown to reduce, reduce risk, especially in youth and young people around suicidality. Um, 
And something that we need to appreciate is that there is a power dynamic. I have white coat syndrome, like my blood pressure is off the charts whenever I go to the doctor. Um, and that's because of the inherent power dynamic, right? There's someone who's more educated than you in certain areas who's supposed to be an expert on your body, but you're the one having the lived experience day in and day out in your body and in your reality. Um, but you show up to the doctor and sometimes, especially for LGBTQ plus people and trans and gender expansive people, there's this pressure or impression that it, uh, it has to be proven uh, that this is who I really am, uh, or it has to be proven that this is how I really feel. This is what I'm going through. And some of that has to do with like just basic bias and discrimination. Uh, and some of that has to do with the lack of training around gender affirming care in healthcare professionals. It's getting better, but there's still so much progress to be made. Um, and so in medical care and thinking about health and wholeness and well-being, especially mental health, we know that gender affirming care is a way of alleviating distress and gender dysphoria, depression, anxiety, a lot of those mental health symptoms for folks who experience gender dysphoria or who are trans and gender expansive. Um, and all of these things can't be seen as just anecdotal, well, oh, it helped one or two people that one time, but it's it's being shown longitudinally over time. Um, and the reason why we lack data around it is because there's been a lack of response and a lack of gender affirming care up until really recently in our history in the United States. Um, I want to note that one of our sister programs at AAAS, Sideline, had an event for journalists a few months ago on um, youth gender identity and transitioning that does touch on a lot of these, you know, so, sort of the evidence for the impact of gender affirming care. So that's something, I just wanted to highlight that as something else that people might be interested in. Um, so, uh, and you had referenced, uh, you know, uh, challenging conversations on Twitter. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, raising, well, sperm and egg exists, right? And something that that I've, uh, something that we run into in lots of contexts in our work in the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion program is that um, oftentimes people aren't necessarily disputing facts that there are, you know. We have an understanding of, of biology that is rich and getting richer, and we have an understanding of development that's rich and getting richer, um, that a lot of the tensions are really around values and worldview, um, or interpret, you know, interpretation of facts. What, what do the facts mean for how we understand how the world works? Um, I wonder if you could, if, if any of you could maybe talk about maybe the role of you know, values in these conversations, like how they show up or how should they show up in how we talk about this as a society or as scientists or as, you know, people in community. Yeah, sorry. I'll try to make them shorter. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, okay, so, so talking about values, we're not disagreeing about facts, we're maybe disagreeing about, it. potentially we're, we're disagreeing about, about values. Um, yes, so I, I think, and this was something you brought up in our conversations planning this panel, that if we can find a value that, that we agree on, like harm reduction, in terms of, August, what you're saying, aff affirming lives, maybe that's a place where that can help us figure out which of the facts, such as they are, are relevant. And this, this is a thing that I think about a lot. One of the things I study is adolescence and puberty. And there is, if you've had an eye on the news, a lot of anxiety about people, people's bodies entering puberty um, earlier than they have in the past. And those concerns that are on one hand about a biological phenomenon are actually deeply associated with the values phenomenon about maturation, young adultification, sexualization, depression, um, mental health and well-being. So there, there are a lot of values questions that attach like iron filings zooming towards a magnet to the body going through sexual maturation. And so that, that's a place where I think, for example, if we can tease out those values around what is happening in the body, maybe we can understand better what are the forms of care and support that young people and communities 
could use. Um, I, I agree with everything you've said, I, but nevertheless, these questions are, are um, uh, nucleate uh, deep conflict. And so the question is whether whether where the conflict comes from, and it's I, it's not. It seems to me that it, some of the conflict comes from deeply differing values, uh, and so some of the kinds of conflict are, I think, just can't be resolved. Um, some of them can. I mean, I agree that uh, that probably caring for people's health is um, is something we could get an awful lot of people to agree is a good thing in principle. But then there's the question of what do we mean by healthy? Um, and for some people, um, and I'm sure, <laughs> August, that you encounter this all the time um, in your organization, for some people, um, uh, non-binary existence is not seen as mentally healthy. Um, and, and so for the people who cannot imagine anything other than male or female, their notion of good health leads to things like conversion therapy because they think that's, that's going to be the health, healthy way to go. And for other people who think um, that the world is really quite diverse and good health involves letting people find their their place among a whole spectrum of diverse people is the healthy thing to do. And how you resolve those conflicts, I think, because I think as a nation right now, we're in the midst of a series of conflicts like that, where we're really, um, we're, we're really in these this very oppositional mode and so the very notion of caring as a value still carries with it what we think caring means and how you get to a point where you can reconcile that. I'm not, I wish I knew. Yeah. And I think this conversation is where we can't take for granted the value of relational education um, and how relationship is such an enriching part of being a human and such a a deep way that we learn in a different way than we can learn from reading about something um, or being told these are the facts about gender and sexuality, but being in relationship with people who are different than ourselves, have different lived experiences and different identities is enriching in a different way and I think can sometimes get past uh, what is often a hard shell on the outside of like vehemently held values um, because when we have value differentials just having a conversation about the facts or even trying to say well we both value human life so how do we go from there well you can mean totally different things by saying that you both value human life right and we see that a lot in a very politicized manner around people's rights around their own bodies thank you um, yeah this is some some great reflections um, so this question is maybe first for August, um, but then everyone can respond. Um, something that I was really reflecting on as I, you know, kind of got to know um, Q Christian Fellowship's resources and thinking about kind of what our program does, which is, you know, trying to bring, you know, uh, have, have science discourse that's inclusive of faith communities. Um, to what extent is it useful to you in your experience or Q Christian Fellowship's experience to, to invoke science or to talk about science um, in conversations among pastors, among family, among um, uh, individuals who are maybe exploring their own identity. Um, does it come up? I mean, is it is it helpful or is it, or is it harmful to bring in kind of or, or maybe it can be both in different contexts. Yeah, those are a couple of different questions in that question. Um, I think it is so contextual. And so if we're talking about faith leaders or you're talking about particularly religious people, most often folks are going to be looking for a theological or scripturally based, a biblically based response to their questions around LGBTQ plus identities and inclusion and affirmation. 
Um, I do know that there are plenty of LGBTQ plus folks who at some point in their journey find science to be an affirming and helpful uh, validation and especially uh, uplifting folks who are intersex, uh, knowing that like the nuances of what we have learned about human biology can be reflective and validating for their lived experiences as someone who's not in a binary biological sex. Um, is it can be helpful. I would say if I were to make a pie chart, it would be more so um, science has been weaponized against the LGBTQ plus community or pseudoscience more so. Um, ideas about what science could be or could say or could argue what facts might happen or exist um, against LGBTQ plus folks from people with influence in faith spaces. Um, I, we discussed this when we were prepping for the panel. I'm not a scientist, spoiler alert. I was raised in a conservative Christian upbringing. I didn't learn about the basic facts about evolution until graduate school. And that's just the bubble that I lived in. I know that's like jaw dropping, um, but it's unfortunately true. And that is true for so many people who are raised in Christianity um, in conservative Christianity is that they are taught a very specific um, type of idea about what science is. And so much of that um, comes down to connections that are made in the biblical text that are not, uh, you know, as you may know, the biblical text is not a science textbook. It is a liter literary collection of a bunch of different things. But um, in many evangelical, conservative, fundamentalist Christian circles, the Bible is like the beginning, middle, and end of the answer for everything, including science. And so those binary ideas around male and female, uh, binary ideas around gender and the roles um, of gender, gender expression and the roles of men and women in society, um, all very antiquated, but can be brought into contemporary context. Um, yeah, I, I also think it's important to, to find out how, what someone thinks science is, because there is the, the, you know, the science as I learned it in the eighth or ninth grade, it was a set of rules that Robert Boyle wrote. Um, and if you follow those rules, you ended up with a fact, which you could hold in your hand. Um, and and it, was, it was true forever. Um, and it didn't matter. And this was the resistance, you know, I and others, feminists received when we started saying there should be more women scientists. People would, people would respond of, why would it matter? Science is objective. Uh, a fact made by a woman would be no different from a fact by a man. So, you know, the men are doing just fine. Um, why do you want access? Uh, but, um, but it's one of the reasons after I wrote Myths of Gender that I realized that, uh, that we had to start thinking much harder about what science is and what, how scientific knowledge is produced and how it is contextualized and how it changes and how it is itself a process and not a thing you hold in your hand. Um, and that led to my own sojourn, which I know you also mentioned, of 20 years of developing a science and technology studies program um, uh, because it was understanding how scientific facts come into being, what work they do, how they go out of being, um, and how new ones come. So science, understanding science as a social process, a cultural knowledge process, is very different from understanding it as um, you know what uh, the scholar Donna Haraway would call the the God view, the God trick, which is you know knowledge from above for all time. So. Right, and, and we've seen resistance to this kind of iterative approach to science uh, recently with. Uh, the coronavirus, as guidance has changed around that, folks who have a sort of the God view of science have, have felt upset by this, as if we were supposed to have known everything right away, as opposed to understanding that we, we learn things and then we learn different things. So they're just, to August, to your point, that particular relationship to science uh, as an iterative process doesn't seem to be a widespread one. 
Yeah, something that, yeah, I think that's a great reference, like, yeah, coronavirus and, and you know, um, in other, you know, sort of contested science fields as well. I think that very few people, in my experience, would characterize themselves as, like, anti-science. But there's not necessarily widespread understanding of science as process, which is so central to understanding what science is. I, I have to say that feminist science, scientists and people who do feminist science studies, there's a group of scientists who accuse us all the time of being anti-science. Um, and they're often very well-established scientists with a um, pretty big forum. Um, I don't need to mention some of their names, but um, but I could. <laughs> but, but that is one of the go-to arguments against anyone who wants to think critically about science is to say, oh, if you're criticizing science, you are anti-science. Um, it's a very defensive position. Um, so maybe building on this conversation that we're having and, and thinking about like how we get to a more productive space, what could researchers, scholars, who maybe are in a more ivory towery domain, um, thinking about these topics very deeply. Um, what, or or maybe scientists or or uh, uh, educators who are maybe engaging more in less ivory tower settings. What could we be doing collectively, or maybe what do you see happening already that is? moving things towards more productive conversation. So how, how could we be, how could, I guess, I'll, I'll, since I, my questions tend to be a little bit rambly, I'll rephrase. What could scientists and science advocates be doing to help move these conversations, public conversations, public discourse into more constructive places? <laughs> so, so one of the places where I've got to engage this a little bit is through um, at Harvard. There's there's a group called the Gender Sci Lab, yeah. and uh, one thing that we do there is when there is a scientific finding that has a lot to do with sex and gender. So, for example, a genome-wide association study that claims we have found the genetic underpinnings of same-sex sexual behavior. Our collective eyebrow raises. Uh, we read the science, the primary science, sometimes we reanalyze the data, but also we are carefully tracking the uptake. We are interested in who is reading this, how it is being covered, how it is being translated, and moving through different news outlets into the world. And then we have kind of a couple approaches that we take. Sometimes it's an explainer to try and do some translational work and get that out into um, the social media and news world. And sometimes it is a takedown. Uh, and that is that when we, we disagree and we think that the science, um, that the data either are inappropriately collected or do not support the point that is being made. And so it becomes a sort of an arms race of, um, of moving your words into the public. We've been involved in a multi-year arms race about sperm, uh, which are also sort of racers in their own right. But <laughs> the, the idea that, that the sperm of the human sperm producers of Earth is in danger, a large study came out about this in 2017. We got the data, we carefully took it apart, and then the researchers recently added a few more countries and republished. So it's, it's an ongoing kind of whack-a-mole process. And I, to, Rob, to your question, I don't know if this is the most effective thing to be doing, but it is a thing that we are doing. <laughs> um, and having also engaged, first of all, I really want to tout that website. I urge everybody to go to the gendersilab.com. Is it dot .com, right? Dot net? Or is it dot I think net? we're an org. We're either an org, org or a org. net. Okay. Anyway, if you just I, Google I urge Harvard you to look at it. It's just a very rich, um, rich site. And it is definitely one approach. Um, but there's a, but I got really tired of the whack-a-mole thing about the time I, I wrote the, an introduction to the second edition of Miss of Gender, which was in the 90s. I was just like, I can't, I, I can't spend my life doing, doing whack-a-mole. Um, and so I became much more engaged with trying to figure out what other ways of looking at the biology are, um, and which is why 
um, I became much more interested in dynamic process and um, and and development is a natural place to do that from because it is a dynamic process. Uh, but so what I what I think some scientists could do productively is develop a different science, a different science of human development, a different science of the body that enables us to encompass everybody we know is out there instead of having just two kinds and everybody else falls into some box we can't deal with. Um, so, and part of that, I think, from mainstream science involves um, acknowledging that there's a whole new developing literature uh, of, uh, first of all, trans scholars who are doing really interesting work, not only in science, but in, um, in things like the law. Um, there's a new book out by Paisley Cura called Sex Is As Sex Does, which looks specifically at how sex is, is rendered in the law in different contexts. How do, what, is, what is sex on a birth certificate as, a, um, as opposed to uh, a, a non-discrimination law in the workplace? Um, and and um, it's, a, it's, it's a brand new book, and it's, it's very exciting, I think, uh, scholarship. And then there's a whole new series of journals that are doing pr primarily social science journals that are also producing um, a different kind of science about gender sexuality. Uh, and the reason those new journals have come up, of course, is because getting your work published in the, in the, in the standard journals is pretty impossible. Um, because they they a lot a lot of the fields like psychology are heavily gated, and you just can't you could spend I have three or four papers which I tried to get published over a period of four years f with five different journals and finally you know didn't and that's why I'm writing a book I mean honestly so <laughs> because I can get the ideas out there that way but there are a bunch of new journals that are publishing people's ideas and they are different ideas and. Um, and the mainstream, you know, an organization like the AAAS could be highlighting those journals more and the data from those journals more and seeing what kind of work is coming out there because it's different um, than what gets published in mainstream journals. So, uh, so that would be some more things we could do. And August, you had talked about, um, you know, maybe to read into your comments, maybe some frustration that like you didn't have access to, you know, a lot of in, in, because of, of the community that you were raised in, um, access to maybe a, a rich biological, you know, study of biology or life sciences. Are there things that y maybe you would have liked to have seen happening that would have been valuable to you, looking back, that that you know educators scientists could be thinking about? I mean, I maybe this exists, but I've never looked for it, but um, be teaching about the basic theories of evolution and biology in a way that is compatible with, and I'm going to like specify progressive Christianity because I think that's the realm of Christianity that's most, um, has folks who are most open-minded to learning science from those perspectives. Uh, progressive Christianity is kind of a movement that's happened in the past like decade or so. It's kind of a coined term. Um, but basically folks who are mindful of the interconnectedness of all these different disciplines and how, and also come from a, a point of view that the Bible is not necessarily the inerrant authoritative word directly from the higher being God. Um, so folks who are moderate to progressive, um, often politically, and folks who have a uh, more open-mindedness to learning from sociology and from science. And so thinking about, um, you know, education that is not totally atheistic. Um, and I don't think it's incompatible because there are types of theology like process theology from Alfred, Alfred North Whitehead, who was a physicist. And so it's definitely um, possible to be compatible and to bring these things together. It's just, as far as I know, not being done yet. There's plenty of Christian education around science that 
teaches what I was taught growing up. Uh, God created the earth in seven literal days, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, things that are considered anti-science by and large by most people. <laughs> so um, that's what I think uh, is an aspiration. Yeah, and I can say that I do know that there are guidelines that have come mostly in the last few years, but not maybe there are older ones as well, that provide guidelines for sort of talking about life science education in ways that are affirming, but I don't think that it's, it's, it's not with, I think, religious audiences necessarily in mind. And so that's an interesting thing to think about, like that facet of it, like moving beyond just sort of teaching the rich, the rich complexity of biology as we know it in ways that, um, that don't uh, erase um, non-binary identity and experience and, 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 uh, the, the reality of, of life's complexity. Um, but with, I think they don't necessarily have that faith component. So that'd be an interesting thing to think about. Um, so, uh, I do want to acknowledge that this is an all white panel, um, and the experiences of perspectives, and I was the organizer, so I take ownership of that. Um, the experiences and perspectives of people from historically marginalized and racialized identities is often very different from those of white people um, in both scientific and religious spaces and in society at large. Um, are there scholars or other voices of color that um, any of you would really like to highlight or shout out that's, that's been influential in your thinking or um, that you would encourage uh, people to, to explore on their own? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in terms of frameworks for thinking about the ways different identities intersect, back to um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined intersectionality as a concept, saying our identities are not just things that exist in separate spheres, but our... Um, our gender identities and sexual identities and racial and ethnic identities and religious identities, et cetera, our ability identities, all these things intersect and amplify one another and create specific spaces that we occupy. So I keep her very much in my mind. Um, when I think about reproductive justice, how we live in gendered sexed bodies and how um, sometimes those bodies are engaged in reproduction in a larger social world, Loretta Ross and Dorothy Roberts are two of the scholars on my mind. And then finally, when we think about the sometimes insidious ways that being perceived as, as sexual beings uh, shapes who we can be or who we're asked to be in society and also the racial politics of that. Angela Chen, who wrote a, a fabulous book on asexuality in 2019 and just now in 2022, Sharonda Brown's book about compulsory sexuality from uh, a black asexual perspective are, are two books that have been really, really important for me. Yeah. Um, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm dealing with, with my uh, elderly mem memory issues. And I'm, I'm about to write the chapter of my book on race. Um, and so not all of, the all of the names that you mentioned, absolutely, I totally concur with you. Um, but one of the things I've come to understand in, in starting historically with child, in, infant and child study in the field of psychology is that it's, it, starting in the 30s, it was explicitly, oh, sorry, starting in the 30s, it was explicitly white. Um, that is, uh, Arnold Gazelle, who was the, the, really the person who, um, who first developed the notion of the normal infant. Um, ex he was working out of Yale in New Haven, and he explicitly excluded non-white families and children, and he excluded immigrant children um, uh, unless they came from, they had to be two generations in, so their grandparents could have maybe spoken a different language than English. Um, so he uh, set up at the very beginning, the norm of the developing child was a white, quote, American, by which to say English was their only language, child. Um, and the field of developmental um, psychology has never really um, exited that concept. Um, so an awful lot of, of what we think of as developmental psychology and cognitive psychology is really, um, has excluded race from the very beginning. Um, and I think there are, there are a number of um, scholars, including I, I've been in contact with people who are currently 
um, African American scholars who are currently writing their PhDs on this. So this is um, the, all of the names that you mentioned, yes, but the, the whole sort of expose of the study of the white child um, is going, it's, there's going to be books and books out there in, in five years. Um, uh, because I, I know some of the young people who are who are working on these topics for their um, for their PhDs right now, um, but if you think about if you go back to Gazelle, um, what he wanted to do was f find a scientific way to match a potentially adoptive children with their adoptive parents with with parents. So he thought he could design a scientific adoption. Um, and what this meant was that only white children would get adopted by white parents, the way he was working at it. And the whole child welfare system, which Dorothy Roberts' most recent book just shreds to bits. Um, and also I'd say uh, Laura Briggs, who's, who's not a, a scholar of color, but who's also writing, writing on adoption and race in very compelling ways, um, that, uh, that the whole child welfare system grew up as a way of managing the black family um, and the immigrant family um, and cordoning off a separate white family. So race is imbricated in this from the very origin of the scholarly fields and people are only beginning to understand that and to expose it. Um, so there's the scholarship that Meredith mentioned um, and, um, and then a lot more is going to appear. Um, Riley Snorton is the one who's written on black transgender um, race and transgender, and maybe black on both sides. Black on both sides. Thank you. That was it. Just see, my memory still works. It just takes a little while for it to rise, the cream to rise to the top. So, um, so, uh, so, yeah. So there, these scholars certainly are already out there, um, and there will be more uh, coming along. I think, and it would be an amazing to get them together on a panel to talk about this. A few that I wanted to shout out. Um, so Reverend Dr. Pamela Lightsey, um, she's someone who writes and is uh, in the intersection of being a black woman who's LGBTQ+. Um, on Q Christian Fellowship's website, we have a document called A Sexuality and Spirituality Affirmation Guide, and that was written by Reverend Tanetta Landisayana. Um, and we also, I want to think about a colleague of mine, Delphine Bautista, who's a Latina, two-spirit, non-binary, trans scholar and author, um, and then also an Instagram influence slash educator. It's kind of an interesting world to be in. Um, an author um, named Walela Nadenha. Um, and so I think if you just look up Walela, W-A-L-E-L-A, -E um, they would probably come up. They have quite a following. Great, thank you um, for sharing those uh, scholars and, and voices. Um, so I wanna shift now to uh, audience questions. Um, I can't promise we'll get to all of them, but we'll do the best we can. And again, you can submit with the QR code uh, behind me. Um, so this is a question uh, that actually resonates strongly with me. Um, biologists and animal behavior specialists study many non-human species, typically type an animal as male or female for their studies and analyses, e.g. in lion behavior. Is this inaccurate? Or do, you know, do we lose anything by approaching that in a very binary way? Well, I'm not a scientist, however. Um, from a sociological perspective and um, from my lived experience, gender identity um, is very socialized. And um, it's not completely a construct. I think that that would be robbing it of some of the fact that there are inherent aspects of gender identity. Um, so not totally a social construct, but largely something we are socialized into. Um, I am also not a lion, so I can't speak to <laughs> whether or not lions have gender identity, whether or not they're complex enough beings um, for that to be true or not. I do think that we probably see gender roles within the animal kingdom um, in a similar way that we see social gender roles and norms and expectations in the human realm. Um, but gender identity, gender expression in particular, as we know it in humanity, uh, is not something obviously that has been articulated and 
like observed that there are non-binary lions. I think there, you know, there's likely intersex animals, just like there are intersex humans. But whether or not that necessitates a, a gender identity or gender expression difference, it's like I'm not sure that we can say. So I, I want to say that that it is a convenient thing to do, but one does it at one's peril, and there have been plenty of examples of of how that peril has carried out. For example, because if we're studying, this is a non-random example, bluebirds, um, and uh, and we say, all right, we're gonna, we can easily tell a male bluebird from a female bluebird by their um, by their feather patterns and color, uh, and um, and we bring with us then a whole set of human stories about what male and female bluebirds are are trying to do or or are doing, and so the initial story about bluebirds was. Um, oh, you have these males and they're defending their territory and the females come in and then, and then they mate loyally with the males. Um, and then a, a, a feminist scientist named Patty Gowati started studying them in context. And what she found was that the behavior changed depending on uh, nest site availability. So that when there were loads of nests available, uh, the males behaved very differently and were, you know, much better helpmates to the females. Um, but there was still this notion that monogamy was what was going on until they started doing DNA testing. And then it turns out that the females, as well as the males, were doing all sorts of extra pair matings that the scientists didn't see. And maybe they partly didn't see it because they already had a preconceived notion about the faithful female. Um, so, uh, so, and, and in the animal behavioral studies, I mean, there's example after example of this, which has been brought to the fore often by f feminist evolutionary biologists who've, who've um, who've looked at things differently. Um, and so doing that, saying, all right, we have the males and the females, it is a convenience thing to start with, but it also brings with it um, uh, the problem of cultural blindness of the scientist and, and a, a set of preconceived assumptions. Yes, and, and related to those assumptions, I think we're, we're in. Yeah, about the graves. Yes, like the story about the graves. Okay, so confession to preface this, I'm writing an essay called Cat Lady, about me and my cat. <laughs> and um, so I'm really interested in the tension between not wanting to anthropomorphize, not wanting to project our categories like gender onto other creatures, and also the recognition that creatures that are not human have complex emotional lives and subjective experiences. And so treating them as consumables comes with a series of ethical problems. So I personally find this, this question from whoever, whoever, whoever asked it really compelling because I think it gets at some of the heart of that tension. How do we honor what is unknowable, August, as you were saying, in the experience of the lion, um, while at the same time doing what Anne is pointing towards and being really careful about what we're projecting? I, I can't resist uh, weighing in as an actual behavioral ecologist who literally does this or has done this in my research papers where you say, okay, well, some females have sexual swellings and some, you know, some female chimpanzees have sexual swellings and some have testicles the size of softballs and like that's how we're going to divide our population and study them accordingly. Um, I think it, uh, as, you, as Anne said, I think it has value, but we have to be extremely mindful of um, what we are flattening, what we might be losing in that approach. Um, it is, I think, an interesting question to think about, you know, is gender something that is specific to modern humans? And I think I probably land on feeling like it is in, in terms of animals that we know about on Earth based on our current knowledge, but also recognizing that we should be able to see precursors to what we call gender in human society in socially complex animals that do things differently based on their um, uh, development and biology and morphology that um, regulate each other's behavior in many cases. Like, we, we, we should be able to see that. And I just want to highlight that um, there have been 
you know, kind of commentaries on this, like do animals have gender? Um, and there's a, a piece by Jay Schwartz in sapiens.org, which is an online sort of anthropological magazine that talks about this a little bit, like what, what do animals have gender and like how would we even ask a question like that? So I just wanted to highlight that as something that, that some scientists are thinking about, including people who study animals. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating question. Well, and I think, again, I want to know what we mean by gender. Right. Because um, the way August started out the conversation was using the phrase gender identity. And we have, an identity is something we only have access to because the person we're talking to tells us what their identity is or how life feels to them or how they walk in the world. Um, but that isn't information we can ever access in an animal that has no language, or at least not a language we know how to read. Um, so then what we mean by gender is something else. Do we mean gender roles? Do we mean, um, do we mean that those are fixed? Do we mean they're contextual? So the, the, even the question, do, do animals have gender, first requires a really careful discourse on what we mean by the world word gender. We, otherwise, we can't answer that question in any sensible way. Um, there's a question to repeat the um, Black, Indigenous, People of Color scholars and resources to recommend it. What I think we'll do is maybe um, find a way to put those online. Uh, so we'll follow up with the speakers. We'll sure. maybe collate some resources and, and share those out um, for attendees. That's great. Um, what do you see, this is an interesting one, what do you see as impacts of the internet, um, including social media channels like TikTok, um, comments, commentary threads on Twitter or Facebook? Um, in terms of gender affirmation. So how, I guess how is, how is the internet and social media impacted conversations around gender identity and affirmation, especially during isolation uh, during COVID times? Uh, well, by and large, especially things like TikTok, which is a relatively new, like short term, short form video platform for those who are like, what the heck is TikTok? Um, three minute or less videos. It is expanding our access and by our, I mean, LGBTQ plus folks access to one another, not just in like a regional area, but internationally. And so with that, there's also exposure to diversity within diversity and the, the great dimensions of identities within the LGBTQ plus communities, um, especially during isolation times and early COVID when folks were all shelter in place and then lockdown folks were so what I was seeing, so anecdotally, what I was seeing was a lot of folks experimenting with hair, makeup, presentation, um, doing some online shopping, trying different clothes for the first time, and doing it all within the safety and comfort of their own home. And um, those kinds of experiments with gender expression, whether or not that means something different about someone's own sense of gender identity, it was really, it, it's been a really unique time for all of this at home time and with myself time for deep reflection that the average pace of our busy lives doesn't always offer. But it also then when folks create content and put it out there, um, expressing themselves and showing like this is kind of what I'm journeying through, it creates um, a validation, a sense of belonging for so many other folks who might otherwise feel isolated or conflicted or questioning and wondering, is this allowed and uh, is it okay? Is it, you know, valid to feel this way or to want to express myself in this way? Okay, great. Um, so this is a question uh, sort of looking forward. Um, where's the science going with regard to these issues? And so I may just modify that a bit to say, are there looking ahead and sort of where you know, fields of neuroscience or, or you know, developmental biology or um, uh, gender studies, what developments do you see that have you particularly excited or intrigued or worried in uh, where things are headed? I have, a, I have a twinkle, yes. <laughs> so this, this is slightly old news, but a thing that has me excited is coming out of Canada which has a really, really interesting multi-layered definition of gender in its 
its iteration of the National Institutes of Health. And so some, some scientists have taken them up on that and they've been doing some studies on things like if you've had a heart attack and you've gone into the hospital, what predicts whether you're gonna need to be readmitted? And so one of the things they've looked at is gender, but attempted to operationalize gender in a whole bunch of different ways, not just how people self-identify, but what roles they play in the world and how others perceive them. So gender as like a transitive verb, you get gendered by people, but also reflexive, you gender yourself. So what they're finding as they operationalize this is that these social axes of gender can have really big um, health sort of impacts. They can be big predictors of people's outcomes. And I'm, I'm really excited to see a proliferation of these kinds of tools and lively debate around those tools because they're all gonna be imperfect and incomplete and reductive in some way or other, but also hopefully productive. So that, that's the thing that is exciting to me. Uh, from a personal note, I'm receiving some gender affirming surgery in February. Woot woot. Um, after a, yeah, thank you. Uh, after quite a lot <laughs> to get to this point. And when I had my consult, I was with the surgeon, but he had with him a med student who, he's a plastic surgeon who's done a lot of work to learn how to do gender affirming surgery. Um, but the med student with him is specializing in gender affirming care and surgery in medical school. And that was just very heartwarming to me, very encouraging that there are going to be doctors in this next generation who it wasn't like, oh, I decided to just kind of pick this up, uh, learn this trade or this specialty skill, but it is a whole specialty that folks are focusing on and they're being taught about and they're currently shadowing and getting some hands-on education around it. And I'll just add in one more thing. In, in the field of basic biology, I mean, what I've been pushing myself, and I'm certainly not the only one who's pushing it, um, is to get better at thinking about organisms as dynamic systems. So that um, so often there's like a study in neurobiology that says, well, we scanned the brains of 50 trans adults and we found this little nucleus was larger in these adults compared to our control of cis adults. Um, therefore, we think that area um, must cause transness. I mean, some, that, that kind of, we find some static result in a group of adults and never ask the developmental question. And so for me, what I say to people when they say, well, we have this result in uh, you know, 50 adults age range 18 to 30, I'm like, great, how did, those, how did those differences arise? And for me, it's always the developmental question, it's always the organism as a dynamic system that's constantly changing in response to what it's, ex, um, it's, um, it's experiencing, both external experience changing things inward and then inward experiences changing things externally. Um, so to, to stop thinking of difference as a static thing that happens and then you have it like you caught you caught it i used to say i caught feminism you know and there and now i'm 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 infected with it i have it um but how how feminism is for me has been an ongoing changing set of ideas over a period of many years so to um, to the extent that biologists get better at thinking of an organism as a dynamic system that changes in a developmental system, um, which goes back to my early training as a developmentalist, but, um, but uh, that that's, that's a set of changes that will change, it will reverberate eventually into these more practical areas. Great. Um, so we have just, we are actually at time, but I wanted to give you, uh, all three of you, uh, a chance to maybe, if there was a question that you'd really like to ask another one of your fellow presenters here, is there some something that came up you wanted to just share about or a flexion you had that really stuck with you, anything like that, um, before we wrap up? August, can I ask you a question? As someone who teaches um, kind of intro human evolution, any tips for what would make a classroom feel super welcoming and affirming when we're talking about evolution? 
and especially visiting some of those 19th century texts that are not where we are now when we think about gender expansiveness and LGBTQ+. Uh, I think so much around what creates space that feels affirming and validating is about being proactive and not reactive or responsive. So like setting the stage and giving pretext <laughs> before digging into some of those materials um, of un your own personal understanding as well as like the research at large reflecting that there is now an understanding of more expansive identities than what like the foundational historical text might address. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'm going to think of something later, and I'll have to email you guys. But, but right now, I'm I'm drawing a blank. Okay. Um, well, let me just. Uh, so, Katie will uh, now close this out. But I just want to say thank you again to our um, three presenters. This was, I think, a really rich conversation. Well, I want to say thank you so much to all of our speakers and to all of you who joined us here and online and engaged in this conversation. There were so many great questions in the Menti chat. And again, I just want to extend our very deep gratitude to Dr. Ann Fausto Sterling, Dr. Meredith Righteous, and August LaPerch for your expertise and your wisdom and for your graciousness and openness. Uh, in sharing in this conversation with us. We so appreciate uh, your being here uh, for this. And thank you, Rob, for your moderation. Um, this is an important conversation, and we are so delighted to have been able to have it with all of you. So thank you so much. We need to thank you guys for organizing it. Thank you.